All right, welcome back. Um, I hope that everybody had a good Thanksgiving, at least uh, those of you in the US. Um, so this week, we're gonna talk about a couple of things. We're gonna talk about training, uh, two different types of training. One's called inversion and one is called, uh, well, one is really, other one doesn't have a name. We're just, I'm calling it full fine tuning. Um, just, and we'll talk about what each of those does in a minute. Um, this is the last sort of like uh, full lecture where I talk at you for two hours. Um, I think next week we'll do a little bit of, I'll do a little demo for each of those, just do like a little demo each week. Um, I think next week we'll look at how to do um, up-resing, super resolution through these this notebook. Um, and then maybe the week after, I think what we'll look at is how to actually rent a GPU. Um, so if you find Colab too expensive or it's just not working for you, um, we'll look at using some tools, maybe like RunPod or Vast AI. And we'll look at how to rent one of those and then how to get set up on all the tools and materials we need. Because um, the downside is you have to get a bunch of stuff installed over there. Uh, the upside is it's probably cheaper than Colab. Um, although I actually ran the numbers on Colab uh, now that I'm doing some training on it. And I actually think it's still fairly affordable. It's still way cheaper than, um, than actually using other tools so far. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So we'll likely just put aside like an hour each week, next week, for people to see the share what they're working on, maybe ask questions, sort of like kind of share with the group of what they're working on. So a little bit of just sort of open group share. Uh, not a requirement. I know lots of people are busy with life things and maybe just haven't really gotten a chance to really dig into it yet. Um, that's totally fine. But for folks who do want to share and maybe like get a little bit of feedback on their work, um, we'll, we'll set that up uh, next week. So probably imagine like an hour of y'all talking, an hour of me talking. Um, and I would say if you're kind of like, at a loss for sort of how to approach the next couple of weeks. Um, two things. One, think about this as like an opportunity to ask me questions. So there's something that you were particularly interested in and like excited by, um, but haven't gotten a chance to really play with yet, maybe dig into it more. And then it's an opportunity to ask me questions in that area. So if you really liked working on video, but didn't get a, like, get a chance to explore it too much, like maybe the next week or two, are you spending a little bit of time digging into video? Or maybe you really got into text prompting, or maybe uh, you're really excited about Stable Diffusion 2, and we can look at it together and try to figure stuff out together. Um, I will say, like, you know, if you don't have a, a, your heart set on an idea, um, maybe a good idea is just, like, spend one week doing one thing and spend the next week doing something else. So um, maybe it's, you know, trying to do image-to-image -image stuff the first week and then video the next week um, and just sort of, like, you know, building up those skills. The other thing I'll say, I mentioned this mostly for my ITP class, but I find documentation to be really, really helpful. Um, you are very likely or probably doing stuff that no one else has tried before. So therefore, if you document it, it's more likely to help out other people, either people in this class, people in my other classes, people on the internet. Um, so I know Sean linked to a couple of cool like blog posts this week from people who are maybe researchers, but also just writing up blog posts um, and already finding really interesting things, especially about Stable Fusion 2. So this, the reason this sort of whole area has blown up is because community people are documenting their work and posting it and putting it online. So throw up a medium, throw it into a Twitter thread, whatever you want to do. Um, I think it's really helpful if you document what works for you and what doesn't. All right, cool. So that'll be next week. Uh, this week, we are going to talk about fine tuning. So um, I'll go over what that means, and then we'll look at two different versions of it. One, as I mentioned, is called textual inversion using a tool called Dream Booth. Um, and the other is full fine tuning, which just means we're training the entire model. Um, this is actually really timely uh, to talk about this because, um, well, hold on. If for anyone that just joined, can you go in and add your images uh, to our data set and add your captions as well? Um, I'll link to them. Let me link to them again in our chat here. So just drop your images in there. And then for the captions, you can add them to this spreadsheet here. And once again, just add the, uh, the file name, not the full path, and then just add a caption here. But do add the extension. I had someone in my previous class who did not add the extension. That sort of broke stuff. Um, so make sure it's the file name, the right extension, and then your caption. All right, cool. So the reason actually all of this is really important to talk about this week is um, as was mentioned in the Slack channel, uh, on Wednesday night or Thursday night, I forget exactly when, um, the team that makes Stable Diffusion, which is coming called Stability AI, uh, released Stable Diffusion 2. Um, and in the past three or four days since then, the reaction to it so far has been that people hate it. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why, and we'll talk about those. So um, 
previously I had sort of said that like I think stable diffusion was trained on obviously the late that Lion 5B data set, right? The have I been trained where you can go and look at all the all the data. The image generator was trained on that. But the text embeddings, um, we're actually still using OpenAI's clip. In Stable Diffusion 2, they've now switched that both models, both the text embedding model and the image generator are using Lion 5B. And what that means is that all of the text prompting tricks that people have learned over the past year and a half, stuff like trending on ArtStation, art by Greg Rutkowski, those sort of things now no longer work. So people were like really annoyed that they'd spent six months building up this really cool like craft and like, you know, kept all their good prompts for themselves and not shared with anyone and now they don't work. So people are pretty annoyed, which is funny because it's kind of always been that way. If you've been in this space long enough, like new generators have, have, have brought new ideas, other things have happened. Like it's kind of just the obvious progression of this field. Um, but people are annoyed. And, and also I'll say that um, Stability AI also did a lot to the actual data set. Um, previously, they were kind of scraping out some of it for aesthetic purposes, meaning if they if the data, if they had a model that checked if they thought images were like attractive enough and they would keep those in the data set. Um, in this new version, they actually went through and scrubbed out a lot of stuff content-wise. So we know they, they, they scrubbed out a lot of pornography and not safe for work images, which pissed off a strange part of the internet. I can't imagine why you would be upset about that, but some people very much were, including Edward Snowden somehow. I don't really understand it. But anyway, certain part of libertarian ideology like was really upset about all the porn being gone from their model. Um, but I think they also actually did remove a lot of the sort of artist labels on things. And if I'm reading between the tea leaves, I think that's for legal reasons. I think they're trying to avoid potential legal issues that are gonna come down the line. Um, so I think part of this is them getting ahead of some potential either legal issues or other big ethical issues. Um, obviously removing porn is like a good ethical issue. Um, but I also kind of assume that one of the things that, we're, we're, that they're starting to hint at um, again, reading the tea leaves from people that work there is that they are going to start a business of sort of being able to custom train diffusion models for individual companies or for brands or for artists or whatever. Um, so we're going to talk about today, which is textual inversion and fine tuning will likely be really important to the future of stable diffusion. The way this model has been built based on everything I've heard is that it was really built for fine tuning, meaning it's built to be a wide base. But the point is that you train something unique on top of it, and that gives you an, a unique model. Again, I haven't seen that like officially stated anywhere, but just on some things I've read on the internet and knowing people that know people, like that's kind of seems like where this is going. So I would imagine for the next couple of months, we're going to see a, another explosion of people sort of learning tricks or people releasing new techniques and things to train stuff. Um, so this week we're, I mean, we're going to be looking at some options that exist today. Um, and maybe it's better to just understand it theoretically, but we'll likely have more going for it from there. Um, so we'll, you like the actual tools we'll be using today might be obsolete in a week or two, unfortunately, sorry. Um, but the ideas and the concepts behind it will probably continue on for at least the next year or two based on what I'm seeing here. Um, so it also like require a lot of new prompt engineering. So you're gonna play with new tools, like those sort of things. So again, it's kind of like, I don't know, one step, we'll have a step backwards, one step forward. And I think we'll kind of see like what happens with the space. Um, the other thing I should mention is that the stable diffusion notebook that we have all been using um, is definitely breaking a lot. I noticed this weekend it broke a bunch of times. Um, and if you go to the GitHub issues page for the person who makes it, they're very aware of it. They're trying to fix stuff. Basically, trying to get the SD2 is now available in that notebook, um, but it's causing a bunch of issues that have kind of downstream affecting other things. So don't be surprised if you open the notebook this week and find it isn't working or you're getting weird error messages. Um, we'll look at one way to just sort of fix that or like get around it. Um, uh, we'll look at that in the second half of class, but also the two notebooks we're going to mostly use today are not that notebook. So we'll kind of avoid that for the moment, um, but it is kind of a, an ongoing issue and I would expect it to be an ongoing issue. Um, for the next, at least next week or two, probably. Um, Sean, I know mentioned this in the Slack channel, but there is a new version of Clip Interrogator um, and it's built around how SD2 works. 
So if you want to get ideas for how to use Stable Diffusion 2, maybe see new text prompts or new ideas, um, you can use this hugging face, upload your image, and you'll get back text prompts that are built around sort of what we see there. Um, so Nat also asked, will the custom models of Pure Release still work? Yes. So a lot of these tools are still backward compatible. Um, so if you found a custom model, like one of those robot models or something, um, you'll likely still be able to use that uh, in these tools. Because um, the reality is that under the hood, there are not a whole lot has changed. Um, there is, for SC2, there's now a 768 model as well, in addition to 512. So there's one that's a little bit higher res. Um, but the actual like loading and implementing of these tools have not, has not changed at all. Really what changed was the, the data set and the way in which the data was trained. Um, so old models will be backward compatible, but also all the people who have been releasing those have immediately jumped to Stable Diffusion 2 and now are releasing Stable Diffusion 2 versions as well. So you'll probably get lots of new custom models as people begin to explore these things. Um, as I mentioned, the notebook that we've been using for the past couple of weeks does work for SD2. Um, the downside is that it's kind of breaking pretty frequently. Um, so for today, we will not be looking at using Stable Diffusion 2, mostly for my own sanity, because I didn't really get a chance to like really dig in too deeply into how this stuff works. Maybe we will, but next week, we'll see how it goes. Um, but all the concepts and all the way we do this stuff is largely going to be applicable for one, Stable Diffusion 1 or Stable Diffusion 2. All right, so we're going to look at the training process today. Um, we'll look at what's called fine tuning. And just as a reminder, the way this, this, this process works is that we stick an image in our data. We train, an we train a model on our images. Our images learn, or the model learns to add noise to images, and then vice versa, it learns to remove noise. So fine tuning is a very common machine learning practice. And in fact, I'm kind of surprised that it has come to these diffusion models so slowly. Um, I know a couple of people are doing it with disco diffusion, um, but for stable, people really weren't doing a lot of fine tuning or what they were doing with fine tuning is a very limited technique, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, but it's been very common in machine learning to use fine tuning. And fine tuning basically says, here's our base model. It was trained for a month, two months, three months on a ton of GPUs. In the case of stability, I think it was 100 GPUs um, for two or three months. Um, and then what we can do is we can leverage those models that know a lot and sort of fine tune them for an expert domain or like to become an expert in some, in some category. So this, this sort of allows us, I've got some graphics to kind of show what I think this means, but allows us to sort of shift the model into a new area of data. So again, um, maybe we looked at have I been trained and we like typed in an artist's name and found that that artist wasn't included in any of that data set. But we really want their style or we want something similar or maybe we want a collection of artists that have a similar style. Um, what we can do with this is then actually fine tune our stable diffusion model on that set of artists, either one artist, maybe a couple images or on a whole data set of images. And we can actually change that model into something new that knows about this, this data. Um, and that's the real power of this. And we'll look at um, an example of that uh, in the second half of class, where I've already gone ahead and trained a sci-fi illustration model um, using the, the, the second half of the class's technique. Um, and it works really well. And it gives us some really interesting new options for our, for our techniques. Um, so there are two different versions of fine tuning. Actually, there's a couple. Um, but the two we're going to look at in this class are what's called textual inversion, um, mostly using a tool called DreamBooth. That's the one most people use. Um, and then we'll also look at doing what I'm, what I'm describing as full fine tuning, which is uh, fine tuning the entire model. So let's start with DreamBooth and textual inversion. Um, so again, the, the idea here is that um, stable diffusion and the data set it was trained on might not know everything about the entire world, right? Um, it certainly probably doesn't know our faces, right? So my face, your face, probably didn't make it in the data set. Um, we either aren't celebrities or we weren't on the sites they scraped from. Maybe our faces in there. I don't even know if I want to check, but let's just assume that our faces are not in there. Uh, maybe also our pets' faces are not in there, or you know, maybe I made a sculpture this week that clearly didn't make it in the data set. But I want to kind of play with that sculpture in Stable Fusion. Well, how do I go about doing that? So that's what textual inversion allows us to do. Um, it allows us to take a small set of images, say maybe ten or fifteen images, um, and then basically sort of brute force push it into the model and provide it with a, with a text token or, an, or a word 
and then be able to actually use that word in our text prompts. Um, it's a really interesting technique. Um, and you probably have maybe have seen people on the internet like put their faces into a model and then turn themselves into superheroes or you know, put their face into a model and stylize it in the painting of one of their favorite artists. Um, that's kind of what's interesting about this technique. And we haven't really talked about latent spaces too much in this class. So like just think about this as almost a metaphor. Um, but let's say I pick a single point or let's say I ask for a cat, right? I say like, hey, uh, stable fusion, generate a picture of a cat for me. What's kind of going on in there is that in this big space, right? This is kind of flattened into a 2D analogy, but imagine it's really a 5,000 dimensional space, which is insane and we can't even wrap our heads around that. But imagine the space that somewhere in that, in that space is the point where the word a cat lives. And, the, and relatedly, an image of, the, of a cat relate is there as well, right? So when I say, hey, find me a cat, it takes that text, puts it in the model, and the model says, okay, you're looking at this space, and that correlates to this image. Similarly, I might ask for a dog, and in that space, a dog exists further away from a cat, right? So maybe I ask for um, a Himalayan or a tabby cat. Those words are probably closer together in the space, whereas a dog is probably further away. What we're basically doing a textual inversion is we're saying, hey, uh, Stable Fusion, carve out a little space for me in this model that is my words and my images. We're not really touching anything else in the model. We're just carving out this little space. And we're saying, okay, my images go in here and my text goes here. And what that gives us then is it gives us the opportunity to put our face in this model and then use all of the other text techniques that are available to us and sort of apply those to our, to our faces, right? So we can use all those prompt hacks. Like we can say like, uh, make my face into, uh, I don't know, unreal uh, 3D engine. And maybe that would make a 3D version of my face, that sort of thing. So that's the concept behind textual, textual inversion. Um, so tips to make this work. Uh, the number of images you need varies. Um, most of the internet now says you need 30 images. The original paper that was made by Google said you need three to five. Um, in my experience, 10 to 15 is, is a good, it's like a happy medium between all those. Um, if you want the best results, what you really wanna do is get photos of your face or photos of objects from basically every angle. So kind of like, you know, take a shot straight on, then take a three quarter view, side profile, above, below. Because depending on the text prompt you provide, there might be a, a suggestion of a, of a like facial direction. Um, so for faces or for objects, you kind of want like a 360 panoramic view, which I guess is kind of where people come up with 30 images, right? You can kind of imagine covering the entire space of an object in 30, in 30 pictures. Um, one of the challenges is that if you find that if you have too much of the same background in it, um, or you're wearing the same clothes, it will kind of memorize that. It's called overfitting. So you kind of do actually want photos of you from a different era or wearing different clothes or on different backgrounds if you're going to try to put in your face. So it's kind of the image part of it. We'll talk a little bit more about the image instructions for this part, but just know you need you know, a small number of images, 10 to 15, up to 30. The next is you need to choose a text token um, that is unique. So if I'm taking photos of my cat, which is what we're going to do today because she can't say no to me, um, I took photos of my cat. So we're gonna put her in this model. Um, to choose a word that, that sort of, we tell like Stable Fusion, like, hey, this word is equal to this, these images. Um, we don't want a really common word. So for my cat, I would not use the word cat. The reason I wouldn't use the word cat is because in Stable Fusion, there's already a bunch of cat images that are associated with the cat text. And what you're gonna have is you're, those, those images and text pairs are gonna fight for real estate. And there's likely way more cats in the stable fusion model than there are images that you put in there. So what people have kind of come up with is they do two things. One is they either come up with sort of like a short, a shortened like, I know, combination of a, of a phrase or they just put in random letters. Um, I prefer using like some phrase that makes sense but is maybe sure of a shortcut or an acronym because um, then I can remember what it's supposed to be. Uh, whereas random letters, I would never remember. So in this case, if I were going to do cat, maybe I would do D-R-R-K-S-C-T. And that stands for Derek's cat, right? So let's feel like we'll just take a, take a phrase and then remove all the vowels from it. And they get this thing that clearly doesn't look like word, right? Like that's not a word in our language um, or this train in English. So that's not a word. So we can kind of guess that if we stick a 
If we look, carve out a little space and stick some images in there around this word, we should be okay. Other people will put in like scene labs to people doing brackets or angles around things. Again, it's all like some word that you hope wouldn't exist in, in this language model. Um, most people use this for faces or objects. You can actually do this with styles. When we look at the notebook, we'll look at how you could potentially do this with styles. Um, this person, Nitrosak, Nitrosaka, I don't know how you pronounce that, um, has actually released a bunch of models that are using styles. Uh, and if you look at their account, Let's see if they say in here. Yeah, so they release these models and they put them up on Hugging Face. And then usually what they say in here is, yeah, so they give you some prompt words that you have to use. Um, and these prompt words are tied to these images. Now, these are Archer, Arcane, so I wonder if it's like Archer or Arcane. Um, that's a way to blend those. So this person does, it looks like they might be using, yeah, so they're using Arcane and Archer. So they, you can sort of like prompt with these weights and get different styles out of them. Uh, this is maybe a bad example. They've got some other ones that I think are a little bit clearer, um, but you'll also find other, other people po who post up their uh, models and they'll all say like, you must use this text phrase at the beginning of your prompt in order to get that style. I personally think style works better with the second version of what we're going to look at. Um, but lots of people love Dream Booth. Lots of people love Dream Booth because it's fast. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, so just know, like, again, we'll sort of look at how this might work. Um, so there is a Dream Booth extension built into the uh, notebook that um, we currently use or we use every week. Uh, unfortunately, it's broken right now. There's literally a GitHub issue that went up 12 hours ago. Um, I tested it yesterday, it worked fine tested it this morning in class and it broke. And sure enough, there's a GitHub issue about it being broken. So that's fine, because we're actually gonna use this other notebook, which uses the same tools, it's from the same creator, um, but it's maybe a little bit more built for actually using Dream Booth. It doesn't matter, it's fine. Um, just know that you could begin to probably use some of this stuff in that extension, if you wanna have everything in that one notebook. So I'll drop the link in here for, for everyone for this. And I actually made a couple edits, so I'll, um, I'll drop links into the edits uh, in a minute. So with this person's notebooks, I never save a copy uh, because they're constantly making edits and changes to things. If you save a copy for yourself, it will likely break. So always use the GitHub URL, um, which is what's here. But I'll make some notes for some things that we are gonna work off of. Um, okay, so first off, I need to switch to my ITP account. Okay, so let's take a look at what images we're gonna use. So I'm gonna share, I'll share the zip file with everyone and I'll add code so you can unzip it into your own drive. Um, but essentially we have two different labels here. We've got, uh, this is my cat pumpkin. And then we also have a famous internet cat called Pudge. So you'll see that each of these is labeled. One is labeled P-U-M-P-C-T, that stands for pumpkin cat. The other is labeled Pudge CT, that is for Pudge cat. So, the other kind of specific thing you have to do with these, you have to label your images with that token. No one has said this out loud when I've watched like five of these tutorials on this. I think what they're doing is instead of actually you feeding it a caption, they're just assuming the caption is the, is the title of the file. So you have to label it uh, pump CT space and then the number because you can't have the same label for everything. So I think what they're doing under the hood is actually just removing anything after the space and just using this as, as the text prompt. So again, in this folder, I've got, I think I've got like 15 images of each cat. So what this will actually do is it'll actually give us two different text tokens with two different cat images embedded in, that, in, the, in this new model. Okay, so I've already zipped this up. Um, did I zip this up? Maybe I didn't. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you how to grip, get this zip from me, and then we will, um, use it in a second. So if everyone has their dream booth open, um, the other thing is that we need to have our runtime set to the standard runtime. 
So I know most of you are probably on Pro and not on Pro Plus. That's fine. Um, that'll be an issue for our next step, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so just make sure you're on standard for both of these and using a GPU. Actually, most of you probably don't even see anything. Just make sure you're using a GPU. Uh, next, we will connect to our Google Drive. And I'm going to add uh, some code here. So I'm going to add a new cell. And I'll just copy the link in this for everyone um, in just a second. So just this. that not hmm. me There we go. Okay. So first things first, we're going to paste this code into a, into a cell. So uh, exclamation point pip install dash u g down. We need to upgrade our version of g down. I always forget that Colab is using an old version. So you'll do that. You'll run that cell. Next, you're going to run this command, which is g down and this whole crazy ID string. And what this is going to do when you run this is it's going to download a zip file. So it's going to download a zip file that I have on my Google Drive down into your Google Drive. And if we go into G Drive, My Drive, and scroll down, we should see dreamboothcats.zip. Everyone there? All right, cool. Next, we need to unzip that. So we're just going to go unzip. Dream Booth Cats. So you can copy in this into a new cell and run that. And now when I open this, I should now have a folder called SD, what is it called? SD Cats. Everyone now have a folder called SD cats in their drive. Oh, actually, you know what? That's in the wrong place, isn't it? It's in content. So it's outside of your drive. Um, if you want to move it into your drive, you can. You just drag it into my drive. I think it's actually fine to leave it here because we don't need to keep it. But remind me if I screw up that path. All right. So now we have our images. Um, we've got 15 images in there. We can go ahead and get our uh, environment set up. So we'll go ahead and hit the play button here under setting up the environment. And while this runs, we need to do our thing of going to Hugging Face and download our model. So make sure that you click on this URL, this URL here. And when you're on this page, make sure that on the model card in this page, make sure there's anything here that says accept terms. Um, I think we've already downloaded this, but in case we haven't, just make sure that you see on here that there is nothing that says accept. If you don't accept the terms, it'll reject you being able to download it, and then we get a couple whole other mess. So if you're on this page and you don't see anything that says accept terms, like I don't, that means you've already done it. Next, we just need to go over and grab our token. So we go to our account, we go to settings, we go to access tokens, 
and we should already have a token in here. So just copy one of them and come back to your notebook. And for this, we're going to use model version 1.5 and we're going to input our token here. And at this point, we can just hit play here. And this should download for us. Oh, um, rocks. So um, <clears throat> you should get SD cats if you run these three cells. So you run this cell to upgrade uh, G down, you run this cell to get the zip, and then you run this cell to unzip that zip file into your content slash SD cats. And our model should be downloading here. I should really edit this. Uh, I don't want to edit his notebook, but this should really be getting saved into G Drive. But it looks like it might not be. Looks like it's getting saved locally, which is fine, I guess, but it's kind of, it makes everything slow. So we're installing all this stuff. Well, this installs, uh, actually, that just finished. It just finished. Okay. So let's move ahead into Dream Booth. If you are um, still downloading, that's fine, because um, we're gonna set, we're gonna spend a little bit of time just getting this set up. So first off, we need to name our project. Um, again, this is really important. This is essentially adding a, creating a project name. Um, all it really does is it saves out your file names with this name on it. But I think it's always really helpful to have a very clear name. So for this, let's just call it uh, Dream Booth Cats Test. I recommend that um, every time you start one of these, you have a unique name. If you don't have a unique name, what's going to happen is it's going to try to train on top of each other. So if you just name this Dream Booth and run it over and over again, it's going to keep overriding um, the previous settings and that can lead to a messy kind of thing. So let's just leave it at Dream Booth Cats test for this session. Um, we do not need to worry about anything else here. So let's hit play. Also, um, because we're not using human faces, we can, uh, we can say just say no for contains faces. If you're going to use human faces, you might want to set one of these. And the note here at the bottom is we have to make sure we name our files correctly, which I already did for us. But if you're going to do this yourself, make sure you do name your, your files correctly, where you're taking that token and you're creating a token for you. So if I were going to name, create one for my face, it might be uh, DS. FC or something, you know? So it's like some little short phrase. Next, we've got our images, but we need to load them into the model. So um, for instance images, we don't need to remove existing instant images. We can uncheck this. Um, again, if we were gonna use the exact same project name, I don't know, say that we were going to, um, say we're gonna test on my face, and I just uploaded a bunch of really crappy photos of, my, of myself that are blurry or noisy, and I ran it and it looked like crap. Um, I might wanna run over top of that with better photos of myself. So in that case, I would keep the session name, but then overwrite and remove existing images. Uh, next, we wanna take the path to our images. So the path for all of us should be this, slash content slash cats, or slash content slash SD dash cats. Um, I pre-cropped my images, so every image is already square. You don't have to do that, but if you leave this crop images on, um, it's going to go in and crop all your images as squares. And sometimes that's a bad, it's a bad idea, right? Like, let's say I want my face, but for whatever reason, my face at the bottom of my photo, it's likely going to crop out my face. So I would always recommend that you go in and crop your photos ahead of time. Um, there's, this there's this tool called burmy.net. This is kind of what all the machine learning people use these days, um, which is like a little web URL that allows you to um, edit images sort of in bulk, kind of in bulk, I don't know. Um, I have other tools in other classes that I've taught before. Many of you probably know that. For me, it's fine if you just have 10 images. It's nice, it like allows you to edit them. Um, 
but make sure you, I would probably make sure that you have edited your images. So you don't, it turns into a mess. Since I've already edited these images, I'm gonna turn off crop images. And I don't need to worry about crop size. We're gonna leave it at 512. I think that just resizes everything. So at this point we can hit play here. And you'll see, sure enough, um, it is now loading, loads in all 27 images, and it says you're ready to go. All right, so now we're into the training step. Um, we are not resuming training, right? We are starting over from scratch. Um, if we were gonna resume, um, like let's say we trained our, our image for a short number of steps uh, and, and we didn't really like the results, we could train it for longer. Again, you set the session name, you either change your images or keep your images and you hit resume training. We're not gonna do that, so keep resume training off. Next, we need to calculate steps. The usual rule of thumb is the number of images you have in your model times 200 equals how many steps you run. So I have 30, I have essentially 30 images in my model. So it's probably fine if I use 6,000 steps. Uh, we don't really need to worry about seeds. We're gonna leave this blank. Resolution, we are gonna keep it at 512 and check the FP16 button. If you don't check this, um, it's gonna create bigger models and I think actually require an A100. So FP16 will train a little bit faster and it creates a smaller model. Lastly, this is actually probably the most important setting in here is the text encoder training. So remember that in addition to training our images, we also want the text encoder to know about our special token. So what this is saying is how much emphasis should this text token have in the model? If you set to 100%, it's gonna like override everything and like you're just gonna get your image back. Um, if you set it too low, it might not learn enough about your image and might not actually be able to reproduce it in the model. Um, so you'll see here that there is sort of a ballpark that if you're training a style, right? If you're trying to train like an overall style, you wanna set it to like a very low value, 10 to 20%. If you're training it on basis of a person, um, it says 50 to 70. I have personally found 70 to be way too high. Um, so I would recommend something like 50. So start with 50. If this doesn't work for your faces, we can crank it up, we can turn it down like a little bit. Um, but I'd say start with 50. Next is because we're doing 6,000 steps, 6,000 steps might be too much. It might lead to something called overfitting, which means it just memorizes our images. I'll talk about what that might mean in your outputs in a minute. Um, but it's kind of a good practice to not just do zero to 6,000. So you only get out one model. It's kind of a good idea to output um, some spaces in between that. So that's what this next step does, which says uh, save checkpoint every end steps. So you can click that. Um, I think 500 is way too small. Let's say 2000. What that's gonna give us, it's gonna give us a checkpoint at 2000, 4000, and then 6000 steps. Uh, and obviously you don't want anything at zero, like zero steps is kind of worthless because it's just whatever your previous model was. So you can say start at 1000, or 2000. Then it's gonna give you 2000, 4000, 6000. Um, let's say I was gonna train this on 15 different cats with 15 different tokens. Um, 15 times 200 is uh, 30,000, 3,000? Wait, that's not right. 15 times 15, there you go. Uh, so if I have 15 cats with each have 15 images, that would be 45,000 steps. On a T4, that's gonna take a good couple hours, six to 12 hours. Um, if I were gonna run that overnight, I don't want my machine just running once it's finished. So there is this button here that you can click that you can check, which will disconnect your notebook once it's finished. It will still save your model, I'm pretty sure. Actually, let's double check on that. Um, we might need to change up this notebook a little bit to make sure we save stuff in the drive. Um, let me check here. Nope, I'm wrong. Okay, it is gonna save it into your drive. So if that way, if your model is finished at that step and it's 3 a.m., um, it'll turn off, you won't lose any of your compute units. So because we're actually just gonna run this very quickly and then look at how it works, um, we can actually skip this. So we won't turn that on. At this point, let's go ahead and hit play. We've gone through all the training settings. And after a little bit of time, it's going to give us a big block that says training. And then it's gonna give us a counter that says, you know, step one of 6,000, step two of 6,000, step three of 6,000.
There you go. Training. And here we go. It's just cranking through steps. When I hit about 25 steps, it'll give me a more accurate idea of how long this is going to take. But it should, it'll usually take about an hour or two, especially on a T4. On an A100, if you want to burn through compute units, it'll probably be like four or five times faster. So you could do it in 15, 20 minutes on an A100 if you're being antsy. Um, when you go into G Drive, My Drive, and then Fast Stream Booth, you'll see there's a folder called Sessions. You open that. And in here, you will see my session called Dream Booth Cats Test. I've also got some other ones. So this is the multi-cat test, the one I ran uh, the other night or yesterday. And you'll see in there, I have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. These are our models. So this is telling me at 6,000 steps, this is what my model looks like. Now, if I open this, which is our current one, I don't yet see any checkpoints because it's saving every 2,000 steps. So you won't see any training steps here for a little while, probably for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. If you wanna keep it training, just sort of see what happens, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna give us, um, I'm gonna grab the URL for this and we're gonna download that checkpoint and then we can use it in our models. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit stop here. And let me go in and grab the path for this file. So I'm going to go to the file that I trained uh, yesterday. And I'm just going to copy this path. And let's add a cell after training here. And we'll do G down. I'll paste this into the chat for everybody. Let's just go okay. So you can paste that into a cell and that will download the model for us. Um, you will notice this model is two point one three gigabytes. So if you do not have a, if you don't have a paying plan for Google Drive, um, be very careful about how many end steps you set because this folder alone is one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven. This is already 15 gigabytes of files here. So um, be careful about what your settings. Also, you can delete stuff if you don't need it. So I would delete this file and then go back and get rid of it. So. You don't want to delete a file that is your final test, which I believe is probably 6,000. Yeah, it's probably 6,000. Um, so don't delete that one because then you can't ever get back to it. But since I've got this and we've now downloaded this into, yours should show up, uh, it'll show up here. So it'll show up in G Drive, My Drive, and then it will say Multicat 6,000. So we're going to copy that path. And we're going to, to test the train model. And we're going to, um, we're going to keep it to 1.5 because this was trained on top of 1.5. Um, we're going to click update repo. We're going to skip session name. We're going to click use custom path. And then we're going to hit play. And it's going to say, hey, do you want to give me the path to this thing? So you're going to paste in the path, which again, remember, is this. You're going to paste that in and you're going to hit return. Now, because this is from the same folks that use the, uh, the web UI tool, this is actually just going to load up their version of the web UI tool, um, but it's going to preload it with uh, our custom model we just trained. So it's important to remember that this model file, the CKPT file, um, contains all of Stable Diffusion plus our two cat tokens. 
Um, so if I ever want to go back and just use those cat tokens, I always have to load in this model. Um, I can't just load up 1.5 and expect it to remember my, remember my cats. Um, you can only do it with this one. So what that means is over time, you might have a lot of files built up. And there again, you might be paying more money for, for Google Drive um, just to keep track of all them. I really hate how slow this notebook is to load. There we go, getting started here. It's kind of a nice function here. So you could save this to Hugging Face, which would then basically like allow you to remove it from Google Drive. Um, the steps are here. Uh, when you write it, when you make a token, you need to give it write access, not just read access. Um, obviously, if you save this to Hugging Face, it's likely going to be public, so other people could use it as well, which is maybe good, maybe bad. Um, if you're using your face or your partner's face or someone from your family, maybe think through the ethical implications of letting other people do that. Um, but you could do that if you wanted to. So you could upload your, your model to Hugging Face and be able to download it using the same tool. Um, and then you could go in and use this tool to actually clean up your G drive so you have less huge files sitting around in there. All right, finally, we are ready to go. So again, you'll probably have a different URL. You will definitely have a different URL than I do. When this loads, you'll see at the top here, we have multi-cat 6,000. So again, let's remember that our prompt is pump cat, pump CT. So let's say uh, a photo of pump CT, uh, sunny day, um, grass, grassy background. Let's remove, let's add some stuff like confusing, um, ugly abstract. Oh man, uh, we can try that next, we'll see. All right, so there we go. So there is my cat pumpkin, um, somehow more cross-eyed than she usually is uh, in my model. And you know, I didn't have any photos of her with this like beautiful bouquet background with grass in front of her, but now there is. Let's try this with Pudge. So we're just gonna swap out the prompt here to be Pudge CT. And we'll try it with this one. And sure enough, there we go. So this took an hour to train and I was able to stick both these cats in here. Now, one thing I'm gonna show you is let's try to do um, a photo of two cats sitting next to each other. So let's do this, let's say two cats. CT. All 
all right, so this doesn't work very well. We can probably figure out why, right? Because we previously have tried to do two animals um, or two paths, and we've seen it, the, the, this, this model is bad at counting. It clearly can generate cats, and I bet if I change up my seed here, let's change this to something like uh, 100. We can generate two cats, but it's clearly kind of taking whatever is the first one and just duplicating it. So the way that we could maybe fix this is let's go to send to in paint. And let's try to like maybe paint in this one cat. And let's just say a photo of pump cat, sunny day, grassy background. Actually, let's just remove all this. Let's try to see if we can fill in with our cat. No, oh, it actually worked pretty well. Um, I've struggled in previous examples to make that happen. Um, I would probably crank up the steps a little bit more. It's looking a little, cat's looking a little gnarly there. Let's try 40 steps. All right, slightly better. Um, so here you can see that there is power in having a model with multiple tokens. Now I'll warn you, you kind of want to do all the tokens at once rather than like, train it on a token, then do a resume with a new token, then do a resume with a new token, then do a resume with a new token. Every time you do that, you kind of degrade the previous tokens because of this technique. So if you're, if you're like, I want, I want a model that has 15 famous Instagram cats in it, um, you want to actually set up all your data first. You want to train it in one, in one fell swoop, essentially, in order to have all that work. Um, but this is kind of a cool technique, and it does allow you to sort of insert these animals in here. Um, or people or other things, you could do objects. As long as you have this sort of unique token, it's gonna allow you to play with these things and sort of experiment with uh, putting them in these positions. And this will work with in painting, it'll work with image to image, it'll work with all the other tools we've used here. So I could actually use Deform to actually animate from one cat to the next, right? I could try to go from um, Pudge Cat to Pump Cat and see if it animates in like a zooming motion or something. Also, when I was previously trying to combine these two, every once in a while I would get a cat that would have the shape of Pudge's face, but the coloring of pumpkin, which was also really kind of interesting. So as you play with these things, you'll get kind of weird mishmashes of things together. So that's textual inversion um, with Dream Booth. Um, again, we've got our checkpoint model, and now we need to use that model every time we want to do this. Um, so just remember that if you have a model you like, you don't want to lose that file. It's maybe where you want to save it to Hugging Face. So you've got access to it later. Any questions about this? All right. Um, let's take a quick break then. Let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 40 after um, and we'll jump into using the other tools of fine tuning. So I'm going to shut off my machine here. Um, if you're interested in seeing what happens when you train this all the way, um, or if you were still training, you still can, um, but I'm going to shut mine off. So I'll see everyone in now nine minutes. So I'll see everyone at 40 after. All right. All right. So before we jump back into you looking at fine tuning, um, I want to mention a little bit about just like what's going to, what's probably happening with your stable diffusion folders. Um, if you tried to run that stable diffusion notebook, the big one that we use all week, um, in the past couple of days, it probably broke for you. So let me show you how to fix it or to like get partially the way you fixed on it. All right, so in Drive, we know that we've got our folder called SD, right? And inside that folder is everything we make. If you go back to your main drive, um, you likely won't see SD old, you'll just see SD. And probably what you need to do to fix everything is actually either delete your SD folder and start over from scratch or do what you see I did here, which is rename your folder. So if you click on this and go rename and then you rename it something like SD old, 
that'll work. What you'll need to do then is once you've done that, you'll want to return to the notebook and start from scratch, essentially. So re-download the models, um, restart everything. Um, unfortunately, the way that this particular notebook tends to work is that when a lot of big updates come out, comes out, the maker's assumption is just you're going to delete your old folder and start over again. You can delete and start over again. The downside is that uh, inside this folder are going to be all the images you made, right? So inside of Stable Diffusion, not that one, inside of this one, not that one either. Which one is it? Inside of Stable Diffusion Web, I, Web UI, you'll see there is outputs and then there are images. So if you delete your entire folder, you will delete all the images that you were working on over the past couple weeks. So you've either got two options. You could either download this as a zip before deleting that folder or do what I do, which is the lazy way of just renaming this folder. Now, if you rename this folder, inside of here are gonna be some very big model files, some like two and three gigabyte model files. So you kind of decide, it's probably better for you to just do the cleanup job, but it kind of depends on where you are in time right now. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, that's probably my note for you. I would say for now, easiest thing to do is just to rename that folder. And then we're going to go back to that, that notebook and restart it from scratch. Um, go do the update, redownload the models, all that sort of thing to get the newest version. And that newest version should work. Um, we're actually going to use it at the end of class today to look at this model. Um, so hopefully it works. But uh, if you do run into issues, I would not be surprised to find out that it is not your fault. It is likely the maker's fault as they try to deal with all the new updates they need to implement. So just beware of that. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about our next version of fine tuning. So I'm kind of finding this as full fine tuning. I don't know if there's a better name for it. Um, I would accurately, I would really say like the other version of, is textual inversion and is not fine tuning, but that's splitting hairs. And most community has decided to call that fine tuning. Um, so I'm just calling this full fine tuning to be a little bit clearer. Um, especially for stuff like styles. Um, it's probably better to have a much larger amount of images for your data set, right? Style is not something that can be defined in 10 or 15 images. And realistically, style is probably not something we want to like carve out a little space for. We want to begin to apply that to a bigger space of in our model. Um, and that's sort of what full fine tuning allows us to do is it says, let's take all of the data inside of uh, Stable Fusion and let's train it with a totally new data set. Um, for those of you that have taken my StyleGAN class, this probably sounds very familiar. This is what we did with fine tuning and StyleGAN models, right? We would take the face model um, from StyleGAN, from the makers of that, and we would fine tune on top of it with our own model. Um, honestly, not a lot of people do this. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so Rox had a question. Is one access token on hugging face tied to a model? No. So basically, if you have an access token, it's always the same. You can use that token over and over and over again. Um, the only reason I have multiple ones is sometimes I show them in this recording and I want to go back and delete those so people can't use my tokens um, for recording. But yeah, you can just have one token, it's fine. Um, sorry, okay, so uh, this is very akin to StyleGAN and how we would train models there. Unfortunately, or like maybe just for some weird reason, most people do not want to do that kind of training um, within the stable diffusion community. Um, some people were doing a little bit of it with Disco, but it was pretty rare. Um, and I still haven't seen a lot of people do it with anything in stable. Um, so maybe one or two people doing it. I expect though with SD2 that this might become a more likely and more common behavior. Um, now the downside of this and the reason why I don't think a lot of the community does it is it requires a lot more data on the level of StyleGAN, right? So we're talking thousands of images, not just 10 images. Um, and it also requires all that data to be captioned too. And there are tools like Blip, which can caption stuff for us. Um, but it's probably better to scrape it as you scrape a caption that requires people who know how to do scraping, like all that sort of thing. So um, it also requires more time and it requires more, more powerful GPUs. So again, I think we're like slicing away at, at, at people's ability or interest in, in some of these bigger ideas. Um, but I'm gonna show you how to do it just so you're aware. Um, and I do think for SD2, this will become more common. Um, we didn't really do a whole lot with data. I just sort of asked you to grab 25 images and caption them. Um, if you're interested in creating bigger data sets, I taught a class about a year and a half ago, two years ago now, um, which is linked to from here, um, that goes through all the stuff for data sets, how to scrape images, that sort of thing. It doesn't cover scraping captions. Uh, maybe I need to add a new 
topic to that in order to scrape captions. I actually found a tool online that just allowed me to use, um, uh, like there was a, like a Twitter scraper and it would grab capture, it would basically scrape the entire Twitter API for a single account. And that would give me back um, captions and image URLs, which I could then download from. So maybe I'll record a video on how to use that tool because I actually found that very helpful because you know the captions are fairly important here. So what I ended up doing for this data set is I took the Twitter caption, which in often included artist names. And then I also used blip to, to describe what's happening in the image. Um, and the combination of those two gave me a pretty good data set of captions and images. And unlike uh, textual inversion, which kind of carves out this little space where we stick in our images, um, you can think of this as, as much more like cha changing and training the entire data set in a new way. So an important thing to know about this is that it is going to alter all of your images in your model going forward. So we've trained this on, on like retro sci-fi images. That means any image using this model is going to have that style applied to it. So again, you've kind of got this like difference of you might want to use textual inversion if you just want to keep most of um, what stable diffusion already does and just sort of alter a little space in it. Whereas this is going to alter a lot of it. And by altering a lot of it, I actually think it does a better job of translating, but it does sort of completely like destroy this model. So you'll have to load this model in every time you want the style and not you'll then if you want to go back to normal stable, you just load back in 1.5. The other thing that is definitely a, a gatekeeper of this is it does require Colab Pro Plus. If you're going to do this on Colab, you do need Colab Pro Plus because you need a 40 gigabyte VRAM uh, GPU. And that is an A100. Um, I assume pretty much no one, only I'm crazy enough to have a, have a 48 gigabyte uh, GPU at home. So it's also way cheaper to, to rent one. Um, so unless you're using it every day, like I do, uh, it's way cheaper to actually rent from Colab in this case. And I would say I calculated the, val the, the cost per hour for an A100 to do this training. And it was under $1.50 an hour, which actually is quite cheap. If you go on to like GCP or anything and try to rent an A100, I think they're like 250 or three bucks an hour. So Colab is still cheaper than those. It's probably not as cheap as RunPod or Vast, um, and we'll look at those, but it's still pretty good cost-wise. And the fact that it's connected to, to Google Drive saves you a ton of headache. Um, so I actually do think it's still, if you're gonna do stuff like this, it's pretty valuable and it's probably worth the cost. Um, this does require a thousand plus images and captions. Um, it requires formatting all those all that data in the right format, which is very annoying. It took me a couple hours to figure out the right format. Um, but it doesn't require the weird prompt token thing about having to generate some weird prompt. Because remember, it alters all of your prompts and all of your images um, using this, this technique. Um, I'll say people have said the results are hit or miss. I actually found that my results came out pretty good. I might actually train it a little bit longer, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, I would update this number to be more like 24 to 48 hours. Um, it's probably based on how much your data, how much data is in your data set and how different your data in the data set is. So I pulled this example from um, Justin Pickney when he uh, created a Pokemon model. He said it took him six hours on two A100 GPUs, um, which would mean 12 hours. I think because his, model, his images were all Pokemon and they're all kind of structured the same way, it probably made training a little bit easier. Um, I would say with my model, I've trained it now for about 30 hours, 36 hours, and I'd probably do another six to 12 just to be sure, um, but it's starting to look pretty good. All right, so let's actually go in and sort of look at this. So I'm going to open two notebooks. One, I'm just going to show you how, the, how I format the data. And then two, we'll go in and actually like use the training. So the Colab notebook is here. I'll drop the link into our chat. Come on. Loading, loading, loading. There we go. So that is the notebook to do training. And then I will also open this notebook, which is kind of a modified version of the notebook Sean shared with all of us to do bulk blip. So I'm gonna start in this notebook. So I'm just gonna get our data set up correctly. So as you saw, I already have this sci-fi captions file and it's got in column A, the file name and in column B, it's got the caption. And you can see I scrape, I definitely scraped Twitter here, right? Cause it's giving me 
some at names and that sort of thing. So the first thing is I need this to be in a CSV format. So I'll just go file, download CSV. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my folder here and I'm gonna, I don't know why you can't just save a file as a CSV directly in a drive, um, but I can in fact just upload this. So I did this in my previous class, that's why I'm overwriting this file. So I've now got this thing called sci-fi captions dash captions CSV. That is a comma separate value of all of the files I want. So I'm gonna go back over to this notebook. I'm gonna connect to drive because my file is in drive. And because I've already captioned everything, I'm gonna skip some of the bulk lip steps. So I'm gonna skip the path, but I do need to install the code, um, particularly because I need to install this with just JSON lines, which is a way to write the particular format that we need to write in. So I'm gonna run this cell. You probably don't need to follow along in the notebook with this stuff since I'm gonna just format it for us, um, but just so you're aware to see like what, what steps I'm following in order to make this happen. So because I asked all of us to like combine our data, um, if you were doing this yourself, you could probably run bulk lip and these cells all in one in one fell swoop, right? So upload your images, run bulk lip on it. That's gonna create a CSV for you. And then you would also um, begin to then convert that CSV into the JSON L file. Um, if you're interested, I also have some notes in here about how I combined all the tweet content. I basically had a CSV of tweets that I would also like sort of like mash up together. So if you're interested in looking at that, that's here. See, this is loaded. Yep. Okay, cool. So I'm going to skip all the way down to the last cell here, which is convert CSV to JSON L. Um, there is a GitHub issue here explaining what format you need to set this into for this to work. It's essentially this format. Uh, actually, it's this format. So you need a these are individual JSON objects. So you need it to be file name, path to the file, and then the caption. So each one of these needs to be wrapped in its own object, which is super weird and took me forever to figure out. This is what's called JSON L, which is JSON lines. So every, if you're familiar with JSON, this is like every JSON object on its own line, essentially. So I wrote this little code that'll basically convert this into that for us. Um, there are three lines. If you're gonna do this yourself, you need to edit. The first is this line here on 45. So this is, let me make some notes here. This would probably be helpful. So line 45 is the path to the CSV file. So I'm just gonna double check and make sure that's correct. Copy that path. And then we need to save out our JSON L file. So we're going to give uh, 46 a new name. So let's call this um, words are, let's just call it words. So we'll call it words caption. Um, so that's line 46. And the last line we need to edit in here is line 27. So let me just write this here, line 27, path to image folder. So if you remember, if we look at our captions here, you'll notice that we don't have a full path here, right? We just have the file name. Um, and the reason for that is we wanna sort of like, we wanna be able to move this around, right? So I could download this zip and share it with you and you can move it into your drive without sort of losing all these da this data. So what I've done in here, just hard code the path to add it back in. Now, one note is if you just copy this path and paste it in here, this also screwed me up for a second. I don't know why, this is one of those things with, with all these notebooks is I found that all of them do slightly different things. So this notebook 
by default creates a folder called G drive. The other notebook that we're going to load this into uses just drive and it drives me insane because then the paths don't match. So in the other notebook, make sure that actually like just in general, make sure that this says drive and not G drive. I kept getting file errors when I was loading in the, in the training and I was like, what's going on here. And I literally couldn't figure out until I like actually tried to load the path myself. And then it was like, wait, something's different here. So just be aware of that weird things with collab. So don't just copy the path, make sure that it actually matches what it needs to be, which is drive. Once I've got those in there, I can just hit play. And it's just going to output all this. So it'll show you what the output looks like, right? So file name, here's the full path. And then text, here's what the output caption is. And if I look inside of my retro sci-fi folder, I now have words-captions.jsonl. So this is what we're going to actually load into our training system so that it knows captions and images together. So at this point, I can go ahead and quit this out. And now I'm going to open my notebook, which is called Fine Tune uh, SD 1.5 Dash Colab. And for this one, we need to make sure that we are using uh, a premium GPU. So again, most of you that are not on Colab Pro Plus won't see this. Um, I am in Pro Plus, which means I need to set it to premium, which means again A100. You also want to set the uh, the run shape to high RAM. This uses a lot of RAM, and it can crash your machine if you don't use the high RAM setting. Okay, so now we can go ahead and connect the drive. Then we can run this next note, uh, the next cell, just to make sure we've got everything installed correctly. This should give me an error. Yeah, it says this already exists, which is fine, which means it's already installed. But I still need to update some other things here um, in order to get this running. So we'll run that. Um, and then we're just going to double check to make sure we've got an A100. All these updates take forever. That's how I lose our like 15 minutes of this class. Almost there. Come on. Oh yeah, Nat, good question. Um, yeah, so while we wait here, let me show you where to access the billing for all this stuff. So um, if you wanna to upgrade to Pro Plus or if you need to um, buy compute units, you'll click on this little arrow here and go to view resources. And here it'll pop up and tell you what 
plan you're using, as well as how many compute units you have available to you and how many compute units this expect is, is expected to use. So when you use an A100, um, you are using, at least as of today's rate, it is 13.08 compute units per hour. So this will burn through a lot. I believe a T4 is like three compute units an hour. So it is far, far less. Um, if you want to buy more credits or upgrade, you just click the learn more button. And that's gonna pop open this. Um, so you can upgrade or downgrade. Um, if you wanna do pay as you go units, um, the only way they offer this is once you uh, hit below 100 units. So because I'm above 100 units, I don't actually have access to this. But if you hit below 100, um, then you can buy credits individually. And I did the math. And at least at that current price, at this current unit, um, an hour of A100 is about $1.25 or $1.30. So that's still fairly cheap, to be honest, even though it sounds not cheap. Man, this is so much load, holy crap. I would say if you're gonna use this a couple times a month, it's probably worth it for Colab Pro Plus um, because I think the number of credits you get by default is like enough for two or three days of A100 time, um, which is pretty good. You're, you'll be able to like do a lot with that amount of time. And then you can use the T4 you know, whenever you are not trying to burn through and crank on stuff. Okay, this finally finished. Um, the one other note I'll have is that you do need to hit this restart runtime button. All this looks like errors, but they're just warnings. Um, so once you hit restart runtime, you'll be back good to where you need to be. Uh, but you will need to rerun the cell because we wanna be in the right path. So we will uh, rerun this. That's why my path is wrong, okay. I hit this thing where I kept being in the wrong path and it's because of this, so now I know. Uh, this should be a lot less annoying. It'll just tell you that everything's up to date. Okay, we're good to go. So let's just double check to make sure we have an A100. We do, that's great. Um, so this notebook was originally from Justin Pinkney, who is the person who sort of built this whole tool. Um, his notebook originally had this thing where you could load in the Pokemon data set and train off that. Since we're gonna train off our own model, I left this in here in case you wanna play with that Pokemon data set or try training off that, um, but I'm gonna skip it. Uh, lastly, or like next is we actually need to load in um, the Stable Diffusion 1.5 model. I used to have this lines of code that would do it, but it apparently doesn't work anymore. The good news is we already have 1.5 from using these tools um, for the past couple weeks. So I'm gonna skip this as well. But if you didn't have the Stable Diffusion 1.5 model, you need to find a way to download it and put it in Drive. Um, next, we're gonna need to set some settings. Uh, you don't need to worry about what any of this means other than to know that this is the right settings for an A100. So we just run this. All right, next is where we get into sort of kind of the, the fun or like complicated area. Um, we need to make a, a YAML file, which is just like a file that holds a bunch of settings. Um, we need to make it with the right settings for our model. So uh, listed under here are a couple of the lines we're gonna need to edit. So we're gonna need to let edit lines 83 and 84. And 83 is the root directory, which I believe is where my images are, and then Line 84 is the caption file. That is where my captions are located. So let's scroll down here to 83. And this is already pointing to the right file. This is where my file of my images are. These are where you uploaded your images to. And let's grab that JSON L file. So it is in retro sci-fi and it is words, captions, 
path.jsonl. So we'll copy that path and we'll paste that in. All right, so I edited those two lines. You don't need to touch anything else. Um, one thing I should mention is um, I did a lot of cropping in my images. I already cropped them to 512. In hindsight, I probably wouldn't do that. I would leave them as their raw image size. Um, the reason for that is, is that in this training setup, there's already a way that it does random cropping. Um, so this is kind of probably overall, it's probably a smarter way to crop because it might capture different elements of different images. Um, it also has a way that auto resizes and it also automatically randomly flips it left to right. So we kind of do want the model to know left and right because for most of our images, that's good. I don't know if there's, if maybe there's a lot of text in your images like you want to train on typography, you might want to remove this line because that won't do the random flips. Um, last thing we need to edit is down here at the bottom is our captions. So what happens is as this trains, it also spits out images that are test images, right? So as it spits out images, I wanna sort of see like, oh, is it looking good or is it looking bad? And the key thing about this is that you probably wanna make your captions match whatever you're trying to generate, right? So we've got a bunch of sci-fi images. So me asking for something like a deer or um, I don't know, a turtle, would probably be a bad thing to have in the captions. So you'll see my captions here are all about um, spaceships, robots, um, art by, I guess this is a sci-fi artist by the name of Frank Frazetta, um, an epic landscape photo of a mountain, David A. Hardy. So I've sort of edited my captions to match sort of the style I wanna go for and the type of prompts I expect to use. So make sure your captions, if you're gonna train it on a different data set, the captions kind of make sense. And I actually pulled some of these directly from captions that are here in this data set where I like kind of mashed up a caption into into one of those just because I want to sort of see it does it actually know the style of some of these artists that sort of thing and the very last thing we need to do is this notebook or the way this cell works is it actually writes a file so this is actually going to write a file into this url and it's going to create a new file for me so what I would probably recommend is that we always update the name for this. So I ran this earlier today for my ITP class. So today I'm just gonna run this for words. And when I run this cell, it'll say I'm writing, I'm, I wrote the file. So if I go into, this creates a folder in here called Stable Diffusion. If you open that and then you go into configs, or sorry, not configs, yes, configs, and then into Stable Diffusion, we should see in here, a file called words-sci-fi. There are a bunch of other examples in here. So if you wanted to figure out what most of these settings do or other things, you go in here and grab them. This is where, because I didn't run that cell previously, I kept having it being in the wrong path. So I was trying to figure out what's going on there. So we don't actually need that as long as you run that top cell. Next, we are ready to run our training. Well, we're not ready just yet. We need to actually edit a couple lines here. So the lines I would recommend editing are the base, so line four is just base, and that needs to point to your YAML file. So again, I renamed this to words-sci-fi, so I'm just gonna copy the path here and paste this in. And we need to edit line nine, which is what model are we going to fine tune from? So remember that we can fine tune from any model. So say that I have a model of all of these sci-fi images, but then maybe I wanna train on just Star Wars images. I could probably fine tune from that sci-fi image data set into robots or into Star Wars and probably work okay. Um, I would say by default, we really wanna just load from Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion is the biggest, widest range of model and therefore it should be easiest to fine tune from. So if you're ever in doubt about what to fine tune from, just fine tune from 1.5. As I mentioned, uh, 1.5 is, you could download it directly, but it's like three or four gigabytes. Um, we actually already have a version of 1.5 in the Stable Diffusion Web UI folder. So if we actually go up here to SD, actually, I guess it's here, SD, and we go into Web UI and we go into Models and we go into Stable Diffusion, the file called model.ckpt is actually Stable Diffusion 1.5. So if we copy that path and paste this in here, 
we're not editing anything, but that's already the path to 1.5. So we're saying start from 1.5 and then train using our data on top of it. At this point, we're ready to run it. Um, a lot of these other settings here were already things we set in the in the thing before above. Again, because this is an A100, I know these are the right settings, so don't don't touch it. So go ahead and run this cell. And again, this takes a little while to get set up, um, but assuming that I don't have any issues with my file paths um, or anything else that happened here, it should run okay, and we'll sort of see that happen. Um, sometimes what happens is if you put in a wrong letter here, like you were delete this, and then you run all this, it's going to say, I can't find the file because the file doesn't exist. So we might have to do a little debugging there. We'll see what happens. Hi, Pump CD. You want to see it? So you want to say hi to everybody? All right, you want to see the, see the real stable diffusion? This is Pumpkin. She was in, she was the star today. Now she's asking for pets. Okay, hi. Right. Um, okay, so this is still going, going ahead and loading. Um, so let me show you while this loads what it's going to look like as it actually trains. So um, in our stable diffusion folder, not in this one, in this one, we have like 10 stable diffusion folders now. Inside of the stable diffusion folder, there is a folder called logs. And if you open that up, you'll see in here that we have, whoops, a folder with a timestamp. And then inside of that is the name of our YAML file. So I named my previous YAML file ITP sci-fi because I was working on it with them. Um, as I mentioned, I've been training a model for about two days now. Uh, the first pass was, I believe, 100 epochs. And that was this file called custom. Then I trained, I like continued training off of that in a file called custom retune. So when I open up this one, this will take a second to, to load because there's a lot in here, I imagine. All right, eventually someone's going to show up in here. I feel like this is so RAM intensive that it even makes just displaying what's in folders like pretty difficult or slow. But you'll see here this is running. Um, it looks like it's we're we're doing what we need to be doing, which is a good sign. But why am I not seeing what's in this folder? Um, all right, let's go to Drive and look at it. So if I go into Drive, I go into Stable Diffusion. And I go into logs and I go into my custom retune. So you'll see in here, there are images, which are our output test images. There are checkpoints and inside the checkpoints are actually the model files. So let's go and look inside checkpoints first. So inside of here, again, remember this trained for quite a while. You'll see I've got, I deleted some of these early epochs because each one of these files is 14 gigabytes. Um, so even on my large five terabyte drive, uh, this is going to eat away at my drive space very, very quickly. Uh, this saves every three epochs. It saves out, which is insane. I've yet to find the setting to change that. Um, but you want to keep an eye on this and delete a lot of these. But you'll see here I have my last.ckpt. Um, this is actually what I'm going to load into the Stable Diffusion Web UI to play with. Um, to figure out what basically what checkpoint is your best, more often than not, it's gonna be the last checkpoint because it's like, it keeps training, it gets better as it trains. There's probably some world where you could have a collapse or some other sort of thing that could happen. Um, but if you wanna double check, you could just click in images and then go to Val. And in here, you'll see a bunch of images. Uh, the images, the only images we care about, you can skip all the conditioning input reconstruction. The only ones we care about are samples. And you'll see here, they've got samples and then probably like a timestamp. And then they're E dash. So E is epoch. So this is the 69th epoch, the 50, 64th epoch, the 59th epoch, whatever. So you can open these and look at them. And if you recall, these are my captions, right? So I had a caption of um, a spaceship in the desert, 
a golden robot floating in space. Um, I forget exactly what this one was, and an epic mountain. So this is just straight samples. This is a sample with that CFG scale, so CFG scale of three. So I actually think these are better images overall. Yeah, so you'll see spaceship in a desert, robot in space, epic mountain. These are looking pretty good. Again, I might train this for another day or two, just to see if I can get the robot looking especially robot-y. Um, but in overall, these are pretty good looking images. So I would actually just say like, just use the latest. This would be helpful to see if like, did something collapse in here or break or go to full noise or just get mushy? Maybe I would go back a step. But in general, I've yet to see that happen with my model. So that's just how you look at these uh, updates. Um, but you'll see here, This is training away. I don't think we see an epoch yet. Oh, here we go, epoch zero. So this is running through a bunch of steps. And at some point down here, it should say epoch zero, but it'll like increment with our number of steps. So you'll see, I think this, I think epochs in general just take a like section of the images. Oh, gross, really? Okay, why don't you, why don't you go sneeze elsewhere? Thanks. Um, okay, um, so you'll see our epoch total is 663. Um, so I think that just takes like a maybe a quarter or, or a fifth of the total images and runs on that. Um, and as this goes further and further, again, it does take a number of hours to run this. Um, in my experience, the first epoch takes about 25 minutes to run. And then every subsequent epoch after that on an A100 takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So you can do the math there. Um, that's like three or four epochs an hour. Um, so if you want to do 100 epochs, that would be 24-ish hours, essentially. Um, yeah, here we go. So epoch zero, so now it's incrementing up. There's no way to set this that I could find that just turns it off. So be aware that like if it's running, it's running. And the only way to turn it off is just to hit the stop or like cancel. So you kind of want to let it run overnight because again, it's 24 hours. Um, if your collab turns off, it's just going to turn off and like stop the model where it is. You'll get the last checkpoint, you can run off that. Um, so at this point, we're training. We've got no error messages. It's just going ahead and training. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to show you how to actually load in this model. Um, and I'll actually send you the model file that we're going to use over GDown, so you can use that. Um, but be aware that it is 13 gigabytes or 14 gigabytes. So if you don't have that much space in Drive, don't actually download it from GDown. But if you want it, use it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take our data that you guys added on top of this, and I'm going to train it for another day or two with that data. Um, so we should see your results show up as well um, in this data set. All right, so here I'm going to hit stop. Oops, shit. Okay, I'll go to here and I'll just hit manage sessions and I'll hit terminate. And sorry, we might go a couple minutes over just because loading this thing takes forever. Um, so now we're going to jump over to our normal last, our normal fast stable diffusion model, our notebook. Uh, again, for folks who don't have it, I'll put it in the chat. Oh yeah, so what's the difference between transfer learning and fine tuning? They're kind of the same thing, um, to be quite honest. Uh, you'll hear people use them fairly interchangeably. I'm sure there's like maybe a scientific difference between the two, but I, would, I wouldn't think so. All right, so let's go ahead and run this now. Um, so we'll connect the G drive. Because there seems to be updates hourly using this notebook, um, I have already run this earlier today, but I'm gonna run it again with update repo. Um, so you'll see there's a bunch of hacks in here for V2. Um, I would honestly say it's probably not worth using this yet for the next week or so with V2, because uh, I just think there's a bunch of bugs with it. So I would say you can use um, Dream Studio, which is Stability AI's own UI tool, or you can use their Hugging Face and play with Stable Diffusion, Diffusion 2, but I wouldn't recommend using this just yet with it. Um, so here you actually switch to V2. I'm going to keep it at 1.5 because my model is a 1.5 model. 
Um, let's go ahead and run this. I don't think I need to re-download the model. Hopefully that'll save us a minute or two. Cool, that works. And then we'll hit requirements. Oh, actually, shit, that was the wrong thing to do. Um, let me stop this real quick. Okay, maybe it won't let me stop it. Anyway, while that runs, uh, I don't actually wanna use 1.5. I wanna use my custom model, right? So I need to give it the path to my custom model. So the way we're gonna do that is, I'm gonna give everyone this model as well. So G drive, my drive, stable diffusion, logs, custom retune, checkpoints, and last, All right, copy path. Um, so let's actually do this. So for everyone that needs this file, if you want this file, you can have it. So if you want this file, let me just send you what the G down should be for this. So let's do G down. So actually you can follow along with this. This would this would work. What we'll do is we'll save this to our um, to our content folder. We'll just save it in here, loose. So that way you've got access to it and you can delete it later if you want it. So we'll just do this. We'll do zero slash content slash uh, let's call this sci-fi. I think this is 170 epochs dot ckpt. Just make sure that works. Cool. This is going to take a minute to download, which is way faster than downloading and uploading it by hand. So if you want that, you can have it. Now, the one other note, I hope this is already set to this. Um, because this file is so large, it tends to crash your basic RAM. So in runtime, if you go to change runtime type, uh, uh, well, let's, let's see, this might actually crash. We might have to restart this. Um, you probably want your runtime shape on high RAM. Um, because this file is so big, it tends to crash our RAM as we load it in. I'm gonna see where we get with this. So let's try and run without standard with standard RAM, um, but I'm not entirely sure this is gonna work. We'll see. So this is still downloading. So what we can do is we can just take this path right here and we'll just say, instead of all of this stuff, we'll go to the or and I'll say path to CKPT, CKPT and we'll paste in that path. By the way, if you have enough drive space and you wanna keep it, you can do, this path. So I'll copy this into the chat as well if you want it. That's if if you want to save it. Or sorry, that should be one. There should be one more word in there. It should be this path. So again, I will train our data together and send people that model as well. Um, but if you want it, you can keep it. It's yours. I don't. This that's what this class is for. So we're gonna paste that path into for path to CKPT. We'll need to hit play to save this out. Um, just for my own sanity, I'm gonna run the requirements again to make sure I didn't miss anything that like, because of this step, I need to switch out. Looks like it still takes a while. Um, we can go ahead and hit plus for the stable start stable diffusion. So just remember, I had to train on premium, but it doesn't mean I need to run this on premium. So training takes a lot of space. Inference or just sharing images from this does not take a lot of space or does not require as, as high of a VRAM. Man, why is this cell so slow? Okay, that's finished. All right, so fingers crossed here. 
Um, if I keep an eye on my little RAM bar up here, um, in the past, because it's such a large model, it's crashed this. So if we see this hitting yellow or red, we're, we're get, we might be in trouble and have to restart. We'll see if this, we'll see how this goes. And we're probably gonna stay like five minutes after, 10 minutes after. So if you do have to leave, that's fine. We're recording this, you can catch up. All I wanna show is um, that one, we can generate our pretty good captions using sci-fi terminology, like maybe way better than we could with, with stable diffusion. Um, but if we try to generate things outside of that domain, we still get sort of that sci-fi 70s retro illustration style. So this does affect the entire model, which is maybe cool, but maybe not, depending on what you wanna get out of it. So. Um, that's all I'm hoping to show. So if you do need to take off, I totally understand. We'll stick around for five or 10 more minutes just to finish this out. I wish this notebook loaded faster. While we wait, any questions about this technique so far? We obviously haven't seen the results yet, but any questions about training or anything else? How many images do you need, like roughly? Because you said more than 10 to 30, but. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you can get a thousand, that's probably good. Okay. Um, I know Justin trained for about on about twelve hundred Pokemon images. Um, you know, the more you have, the better. Uh, and I think the the less you have, the more likely you are just to get a lot of overfitting. So just okay. end up seeing the same image pop up in, in multiple places with lot with the same sort of uh, text prompts. And. Um... What about because I know style again, like really wanted things to be in the same spot yeah and like how does image variation matter less so uh in my experience a lot less so with this okay. all right so you did see my ram crash you'll see this this command c means we broke something so i'm going to restart this i'm going to restart this i'm actually going to restart it in um premium on both but you really only need high ram so to run this model you actually do need colab pro not colab pro plus just because you need that high ram setting um, I'm just going to run this in premium just so we can crank through this a little bit faster because um, this is way too slow for me and I'm getting really annoyed that we're waiting around for this to load. So just let me run this really quickly. Oh, okay. I don't need to run that. I can run, oh. Okay, I'm gonna update my path here for this one. It is in Let's hope this runs a little bit faster. I think there's a way to prune this model down to be a little bit smaller, which I think might help with that RAM issue. I just need to talk to Justin about, about that. I think I've seen some stuff in the GitHub issues around the fact this model is so large because it's saving out multiple stuff it doesn't really need. All right, while well, this runs, any other questions that I can answer for folks? All right, let's hope this run, runs faster on A100. Hey, Derek, I have an unrelated question. Yeah, go for it, please. 
So say you have a, a batch of images with text and you want to remove the text and have it like automatically be um, in painted or just mm -hmm. remove the text and have something, maybe the pixels nearby, fill it in. Would you use, could you use um, SD for that or what would you use? What yeah, I'd probably use SD for that. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I have seen, so far I've seen that in painting and out painting work better on Dolly 2 than they do on Stable Diffusion. Mm -hmm. um, so if quality is really what you're interested in, I would probably recommend Dolly 2. Um, mm -hmm. They obviously have their own payment programming to set up and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But in general, I've seen a couple of videos on YouTube and they've done side-by-side -side comparisons and Dolly 2 blows away Stable Diffusion for in painting and out painting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Okay, thanks. I think some of it is because Stable Diffusion, even Stable Diffusion 1, needed different prompting. It's just, it was close enough to what we had with Dolly 2 or with other models that people sort of like, were like, okay, this is fine. Um, but I do think with the new version, people are gonna probably go back to Stable Diffusion 1 and also realize like, oh, actually better prompting would have helped this mo these images too. Um, so I think that's why in-painting and out-painting in particular don't necessarily work that well. Got it. All right, we're loading. Let's load up. Let's load these weights faster. All right, well, this works. I can show a little spoiler about what this looks like. We'll try a different prompt. Um, but I did this in, my, in the ITP class uh, earlier today. And so this was the exact same prompt. I think it was something like, uh, a submarine emerges from the ocean and a wave is behind it. So this is Stable Diffusion 1.5, the base Stable Diffusion model with that text prompt. Using this model with the exact same text prompt, no other changes, this is the image I get. So wow. you can see, yeah. So you That's can see cool. how different of an effect the sci-fi images have on the data set. Mm. Because it's sort of like there's no photorealistic images in this model. And you even like it even understands a better idea of like the waves behind it, which is kind of cool. Mm. All right. So let's see if this is up and running now. Cool, we're running. And at the top here, you will see that it says last checkpoint. So let's go ahead. Usually something that I like to do just to start with is I like to grab one of these. Um, let's grab one of the newer text prompts, which we have. So again, this model has not been trained on the text prompts that you provided. So let's just go and grab one of those. So let's grab um, a painting of a man standing in front of a mountain, an airbrush painting by Wayne, Wayne Barlow. Let's try this. So let's just grab this one and let's put this in stable diffusion. And let's add some negative prompting of boring uh, texts using abstract. Now, one other note that I've found with this particular model is you don't want the CFG scale that high. Uh, actually, let's just run it and I'll show you what I mean. So we'll make, let's make the steps 35. Let's go ahead and generate. So you see how my colors and everything's kind of blurry? I don't know why in particular with, the, with these models, it's like this, but if you turn the CFG scale down to like a three, you're gonna get a much better output. Yeah. Not sure why standard stable diffusion uses seven as a default, but this works much better with a three. So, um, we can go ahead and use this uh, as just our image. So like, you know, this is pretty working pretty well and it's never seen this caption before, right? Because this is in the newest data set. I didn't train on this data. Um, so you can grab one more of these. Let's grab, let's grab a group of penguins. Let's see if it knows about penguins.
would say it does not. Maybe it knows about a nebula, maybe it knows about floating. Um, I found animals, this one really struggles with animals because of the fact that there aren't a lot of animals in the data set. Um, we even try, let's try a couple of different options. Let's try four images. So even with these four, I feel like this one's maybe getting some snow in here. And I feel like maybe this one's trying to generate some penguins, but they're pretty bad. So again, um, you know, what's happened here is this whole model has been shifted toward this style. And no matter what you put in, it's gonna try to generate style of that image, of those images. Um, so remember this is kind of destructive, right? It's like shifting everything away from that and you can't get back to that stable effusion. So that's sort of the difference between textual inversion, where you're just sort of carving out a little space for it and sticking it in, but still using the rest of stable effusion. Whereas this is saying shift everything this way. And when you do this, you actually do get some nice benefits. Like, like let's just maybe say, let's actually just remove all of this. Let's see what this generates for us. So I do get some really quite beautiful images, right? Um, like this really has that sort of psychedelic 70s sci-fi art aspect to it. Um, but again, now this model only generates 70s sci-fi art. It doesn't generate anything else. No matter what you put in, you're going to get out 70s sci-fi art. Um, and maybe when I add in your, your images, it might, be, it might shift a little bit in a different direction. We could probably do some like all space art and like then it would be able, maybe a little bit wider, right? So again, it's also about like, how much data do you put into this model? Do you have 10,000 images that cover, you know, tens and twenties version of space, which is like black and white up through like today, which might be more 3D models. That would give you a wider range, but you also need more data. You have to train it for longer. You need captions for all those things. Or do you kind of slice it very narrowly and have this kind of cool art style? That's still only, this still only took me a day or two to train. It was a little bit more expensive. It was like 25 or 30 bucks to train this. But, you know, so this is kind of what I think, this is where I think Stable Fusion 2 is probably headed, is they're likely going to do more slices of these type of models, right? Maybe Disney will license a model for them where they say, you can legally have my, the Disney images and we will charge Disney fans, you know, a ton of money to have their face put into a Disney cartoon or something. Um, or someone else will say like, you know, maybe Marvel will say, hey, we want to commission a Marvel data set or something. I think that's where Stability wants to move to. Whether or not they get there is a different story. But again, even we can then begin to fine tune these models and do interesting things. So I don't know, we'll, I might try to fine tune on Stable Diffusion 2 to see what that's like as well. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if Justin's repo actually does allows for that yet, but I think it's interesting. I think it really gives you a lot of opportunity to sort of explore and try different things. And as you know, from my style game classes, I love creating data sets and having more control over the data that we, that we generate with these things. This feels a little bit more like I put a lot of effort into this and I got to choose my captions. I'm kind of like, it's a little bit more control over like the overall images. And I could stick this into Dforum and animate these things. Or I could stick it into, you know, image to image and then draw out little outlines and shapes and structures and generate these images from it. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to play with all of these different aspects of it. Um, so I think this is a cool tool, but I recognize it's also like quite a heavy lift. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, now I could go back and actually switch to the old model and like compare apples to apples. Um, I'm not going to do that because we already did it with this prompt. I can tell you it already looks very different, um, but you could even bounce around back and forth between those. Uh, the thing I don't like about this is it takes like five minutes to reload each one of these checkpoints. So I'm not going to do that. If you now have access to the model, if you want to do it yourself um, and sort of see just how different they are between each of these. Cool, so that was the two different versions of training I wanna cover. Um, any other questions before we wrap up for the night? Cool, um, well, midweek or maybe in a couple of days, I'll share the newest version of this model uh, based on the training that we did with, with the data you guys provided me and the class before provided. Um, so we should, again, 
y'all provided maybe 250 images. I already have 2,500 in there. It's still going to weight very heavily toward my images, but we might get a little bit of interesting data from the images you added as well. All right. Um, so cool. Next week, uh, maybe if you haven't played around with stuff yet, um, maybe come through and actually like sort of um, just come with ideas. Like, hey, I want to spend the next two weeks exploring more of this. Or if you have questions for me, come with that. Um, and we can just sort of talk through that. I will also show how super resolution works um, for anyone that is interested in that. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sticking around for 10 extra minutes. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will see everyone next week. All right. Bye, everybody.